Liger It might sound like something out of a fantasy movie, but ligers are real. A cross between a male lion and a female tiger, the liger is the result of man-made breeding, but because lions are from Africa and tigers are from Asia, the liger is not something usually found in nature. Sadly, they seem to mostly have been created as a way to entertain people at zoos. With most ligers coming in much larger than any lion or tiger, they are believed to suffer from a form of gigantism, which means they do not stop growing. This means they often have bone, muscle, and joint problems. There are also often genetic mutations when the lion and tiger breed together. One can't deny they look unique, though. With equal parts lion and tiger, they are usually tawny or light in color with the stripes of a tiger. Most usually weigh in at almost 1,000 pounds and can eat over 50 pounds of raw meat at every meal. With geography an obstacle and crossbreeding resulting in offspring with various medical problems, it might be better to just imagine a world with ligers in it than to see these animals suffer for entertainment purposes. Asiatic Lions Lions are one of the most majestic animals in the world, but that doesn't mean they are not at risk. The Asiatic lion is one such species whose numbers are dwindling. With only several hundred of the Asiatic lions still surviving, the Asiatic lion, which is smaller than other lions, are only found in a very small area of the world. Although they were once found from Turkey across Asia to eastern India, due to being hunted to near extinction, they are now only found in the Gir Forest in India, an area smaller than Greater London. About 10% smaller than their African cousins, Asiatic lions have a larger tuft of fur on their tails and have a distinctive fold on their bellies. The males of the species tend to live away from the females unless they are ready to mate or have a big kill to share. Males also have a shorter, darker mane than African lions. Almost extinct, they now live in areas that protect them from poaching in five sanctuaries of forest. Poaching is not the only problem these lions must face. Forest fires, other natural disasters, and the population encroaching on their natural habitat all put them at risk. They need grasslands, acacia patches, and orchards as refuge, but as development continues to seep its way into these natural areas, humans and lions continue to interact, putting these noble creatures in danger of once again falling victim to possible extinction. Barbary Lion Barbary, or Atlas lions, were once known to roam through the deserts of northern Africa, often found from Morocco to Egypt. They were the largest of the lion subspecies, admired for their dark manes, and known to have been once kept by royal families of Morocco and other northern Africa nations. You might know these lions best as ones that battled gladiators in ancient Roman Colosseum, as well as being displayed at many European zoos. Sadly, these events are what led to their decline. With so many being killed for sport, others pushed into smaller territories and European hunters arriving to hunt those that remained. By the 1920s, Western scientists believed they were completely extinct, but as late as the mid-1960s, research shows that there could have been a small pocket of Barbary lions still alive in Algeria and Morocco. Various nature conservancy programs researched and found accounts of sightings well after 1922 from remote Algerian communities who swear they saw these lions in the wild. It would be nice to think that despite being hunted or used for sport that the species could have survived in the wild long after they were thought to have died out. This largest of the lion subspecies was known for their long, dark-haired manes that extended over their shoulders and down to their bellies. They were believed to have adapted these colors and their large size due to environmental temperatures in the Atlas Mountains, which was much lower than the other regions in Africa and their nutrition. With some zoos boasting that they still have true Barbary lions in their hands, including one Czech zoo who had two Barbary lion cubs born in 2019, one can hope these majestic creatures still exist. And even though seeing them in captivity isn't ideal, it may be better than the alternative of them going completely extinct. Transvaal Lion one of the most unique species of lions are the Transvaal lion. Named for the Transvaal region of Africa, where they were found, this lion looks different than others on first sight. Born with a condition known as leucism, these lions have a lighter coloring in their coats, with their cubs born completely white. They do still retain coloring on their nose and feet pads, and some are known to have blue eyes. 
As the lions age, their fur becomes more cream-colored. Preferring to live in semi-arid habitats like grasslands and savannas, they are known to hunt large animals like wildebeest, buffaloes, impalas, gazelles, and zebras. Ranging from 240 to 400 pounds, the females are slightly smaller than the males, who have been known to reach over 550 pounds and stand from 3 to 4 feet. Reaching the age of maturity around 3 or 4 years of age, Transvaal lions only live to about 10 years in the wild. Ethiopian Lion In a remote national park in Ethiopia, a species of lion believed to be extinct was rediscovered in 2016. Wildlife conservationists from Oxford University in England had heard stories from park staff and locals about lions living in Alatash National Park in northwest Ethiopia near Sudan. After setting up a series of cameras to capture photos overnight, the team captured images of the rare Central African species, the Ethiopian lion. Although the original population of lions at the early part of last century saw some 400,000 lions cross Africa, the count has now dwindled to only around 20,000, so for conservationists, these sightings are exciting. With an estimated 100 to 200 lions believed to live in the national park. Although some might believe poaching is the main reason for such declines, wildlife program manager Mark Jones believes conflict with locals, loss of habitat, and loss of prey are more dire consequences for the lion population. Sightings of this rare species are indeed exciting. When an ornithologist from the University of Utah traveled to the Bale Mountains National Park in 2017, he intended to study the long-term effects of climate change on birds. As it turned out, he ended up stumbling upon one of the black-maned Ethiopian lions while out at night. Capturing footage of this rare creature out for a nightly stroll, a truly once-in-a-lifetime experience. Uh, this Ababa lion. While you might think all lion species are related in some way, researchers recently discovered the Addis Ababa lion in Ethiopia is actually genetically different than other lion populations. Due to this finding, their hope is for stricter conservation actions to preserve the vulnerable species. The lions, whose long, dark manes and smaller size sets them visually apart from other lion species, have distinct DNA, which was discovered by a team who studied the 15 lions captive in the Addis Ababa Zoo. They found that the males at the zoo were were the last existing lions to have the distinctive mane, making them genetically distinct from all existing lion populations. By treating these lions as genetically different, it would allow conservationists to further protect them from extinction. By instilling a captive breeding program, they would hopefully be able to preserve this most unique subspecies in Ethiopia, where lions continue to dwindle. Originally belonging to the late emperor of Ethiopia, these lions continue to be a link to the past of the Ethiopian species. And while some still hope that studying them might provide links to wild relatives, protecting those that remain is the only way to stave off extinction of this unique species. White Lion In March of 2018, wildlife guides at a game reserve in South Africa came upon a sight they never expected, a rare white lion cub in the wild. While watching a male lion sleeping near the Timbavati River, a field guide at the reserve named Lyle McCabe heard the call of a young cub coming from a nearby thicket. Moving closer to investigate, McCabe saw the lion poke its head up from where it was nursing. Even though white lion cubs are not completely unheard of, they are rare, because they are only born when both parents have a recessive mutation in the gene that produces melanins, not considered albino. These white lions are known as leucistic because they do retain some pigments on different areas of their bodies. Their majestic appearance has given them the distinction of being revered as sacred beings by tribes in southern Africa. They are also considered symbols of leadership and pride to those living in the Timbavati region. They are known to have gold or blue eyes, with black features on their noses and behind their ears. The males have white, blonde, or pale hair in their manes and on the ends of their tails. Sadly, because they look so different, it often means means white lion cubs are more susceptible to attack from other predators because they stand out. Their usual tawny color allows them to more easily blend into the tall grasses and other vegetation. They also hunt more at night, which would put white lions at a further disadvantage when trying to stay camouflaged while tracking prey. Unfortunately, putting white lions into captivity to breed them is not a better option. A study done on 19 white lion cubs bred at a zoo in Italy showed that four were stillborn and another 13 did not survive the 
first month. Only one of the cubs lived for an extended period, and even then, it suffered from neurological disabilities. No one knows why they fare better in the wild as opposed to breeding in captivity, but for now, we can have some hope that even in small pockets, this rare breed, known to survive in the wild for up to 18 years, continues to persevere. Cape Lion the second largest and heaviest of lion subspecies, the Cape Lion, weighed over 600 pounds and was 1.5 times larger than the average African lion. Distinguished by its thick black mane and gold fringe around its face, the big cat was known to grow up to 11 feet long and weighed up to 500 pounds. Named for their native range on the Cape of Africa, the lion was one of two subspecies living in the Karoo Plains of South Africa in and around Cape Town. Unfortunately, due to Dutch and English settlers coming to the continent to hunt for sport, the Cape Lion, having lived from 500,000 years ago, finally went extinct when the last of the lions was killed in the mid-1800s. Some believe that because subspecies tend to interbreed, it is possible Cape Lions were an isolated tribe of Transvaal lions, who, as we talked about already, still survive in South Africa. The sad fate of these lions can be directly connected to overhunting, but in the early 2000s, some were supposedly discovered in a Russian zoo. With plans to do genetic testing and introduce a rebreeding program to bring the now extinct species back to prominence, the hope of repopulating the Cape Lion disintegrated when the zoo director died in 2010 and the zoo closed. Today, only stuffed specimens remain, with natural history museums in London, Paris, and Germany displaying these lost links to a noble species gone too soon. The Devil's Sinkhole in Rock Springs, Texas, there's a deep, dark sinkhole that's estimated to be around 400 feet deep, and with a name like the Devil's Sinkhole, you just know that it's got to be creepy. And in fact, there are pieces of archaeological evidence around the area which suggests that the site might have been considered sacred by the Native Americans who lived there. Near the sinkhole, there are a few ancient camping areas. After picking through the things left there, they date these encampments between 2500 and 4000 BC. Native people likely found the Devil's Sinkhole quite useful because they were able to extract large quantities of chert, a great Stone Age resource, from its interior. And years later, it became a hangout for cowboys whose graffiti still lines the walls of the hole. But it's perhaps best known for the large amount of bats that live there. When it's hot enough, around 3 million bats emerge from inside to look for snacks. Located inside the Devil's Sinkhole State Natural Area, you can't go inside of the sinkhole itself. Local officials are trying their best to protect the bats, but you can go see the flight of the bats. Have you ever been to this natural area before? Tell me how it was down below. A Greco Gypsum Stack in 1994, a giant 15-story sinkhole developed in Mulberry, Florida underneath an unfortunate place, an 80 million ton stack of gypsum, which is a toxic, slightly radioactive material. This was not good news for Florida because it infected a good chunk of the state's drinking water. Some estimates go so far as to say this sinkhole injected more than 215 million gallons of contaminated water directly into Florida's water supply. In particular, this toxic water went through the Florida Aquifer, which accounts for around 60% of Florida's drinkable water. This water was about as acidic as lemon juice. There were great efforts put into place after the formation of this sinkhole and the project cost the area millions. The sinkhole itself was 45 feet wide, almost 300 feet deep, and had a volume of around 2 million cubic feet. The hole was nicknamed Journey to the Center of the Earth by locals. It's good that they got enough distance from this disaster to give it a fun name, because it couldn't have been fun to contain this disaster. Ohio Sinkhole in Crooksville, Ohio, a local pizza joint, Sprankles Village Pizza, had to be demolished because a large 20-foot sinkhole developed directly underground. It was almost big enough that they were worried the whole building might fall into the ground. It's impossible to predict when and where sinkholes are going to form, so it's quite sad whenever a good restaurant falls prey to these random natural disasters. It was the first pizza restaurant in all of Crooksville and had been there for around 50 years. The sinkhole caused the first floor to partly collapse, leading to a lot of internal destruction. When the sinkhole formed, employees and locals flocked to the building to rescue as much equipment, and pizza, I imagine, as they could. Sadly, the business didn't have any insurance, but at least the community is getting together to pay for the place to be demolished. What happened, though? The family that owned it thinks that it's because of the combination of living in between a creek and some railroad tracks. The water probably conducted some erosion on its own, and the constant shaking of trains didn't help. But at least, the community will always have their memories of Sprankles. Bema Sinkhole 
The residents of a northern Oman town, Bima, made the most of a dire situation and turned a giant sinkhole in their town into a big swimming park. And even though you might not think that a sinkhole could be made up, it's actually pretty beautiful. Look here at the beautiful turquoise waters inside the sinkhole and you can see that this might be a place you should visit. For years, locals thought that the giant depression in the earth was due to a meteorite, and in fact, many of them still do. That's why the local name for the park is Hawid Najum, which means the falling star. Legends are resistant like that, but geologists have looked into the site and they claim that the formation is a natural sinkhole. And it's deeper than most pools you'll be able to visit, extending approximately 65 feet into the earth. As you can see, you don't have to climb down into the sinkhole to have a good time. Local officials have built a long staircase that extends into the swimming hole. It wasn't a natural formation, alas. The water is mighty salty, but if you're adventurous, you can still go and dive off the cliffs inside the sinkhole. The Dead Sea Sinkholes Over the past few decades, thousands of sinkholes, ranging from tiny to relatively large, have been appearing near the Dead Sea. Scarily, this has been happening for a while without any warning signs making tourism there a dangerous venture. You don't want to visit someplace if you think that you're going to fall into the earth. Especially if the whole point is to experience the sea's healing, mineral abundant waters. So why has this been happening? Scientists have figured out some answers. The Dead Sea's water level has been continuously shrinking for years, and now it's going at a pretty fast rate. Every year, the Dead Sea's waters shrink by around 3 feet. As this happens, the groundwater pools around large layers of salt, which the Dead Sea has in droves. It's approximately three times saltier than the world's oceans. However, once the groundwater dissolves these areas of salt, they leave gaping holes underneath the ground. They implode on themselves and create sinkholes, and sadly, it's very hard to predict when they're going to come about. The water level is decreasing because it is receiving less water from the Jordan River. Have you ever seen any of these sinkholes that form around the Dead Sea? Let me know in the comments below. Zaozai Tian Kang The Zaozai Tian Kang, also known as the Heavenly Pit, is one of the biggest natural sinkholes on Earth, and technically, the world's deepest sinkhole that we've found. It's estimated to be somewhere between 1,677 to 2,172 feet deep. It has an upper bowl and a lower bowl which are both connected by a sort of rocky slope. Sometimes a waterfall will even form if it's rainy enough. Scientists think that the Zaozai Tian Kang formed over the Defang Cave. They say that after the cave had eroded enough due to an underground river, it collapsed entirely, creating a giant sinkhole above the ground. Geological processes take a long time and this historical story takes place over about 2 million years. But humans have known about the sinkhole since antiquity. You can go see it for yourself, now that there is a giant staircase descending deep inside of it. The bottom of this sinkhole is also a unique area of biology. Because the bottom is so large, it can sustain a great variety of flora and fauna, like ginkgo biloba. Some have even spotted clouded leopards at the bottom, which has a population of less than 10,000. These features make the Zaozai Tian Kang one of the most intriguing natural attractions that the modern world has to offer. Guatemalan Sinkhole in 2010, a giant sinkhole appeared in the middle of Guatemala City. This isn't the first time it's happened. In fact, because of the city's deteriorating infrastructure underground, sinkholes keep appearing in random places. But this one was the biggest yet. Onlookers judged that the sinkhole had around a 60-foot diameter and that it went around 300 feet deep into the ground. That's around the height of a 30-story building. But it's not the city's infrastructure alone that's causing these sinkholes to pop up everywhere. All of its infrastructure is built in an area whose ground is made of pumice fill, which is a gravel-esque volcanic flow which gets condensed into solid rock once it cools down. But in Guatemala City, this material hadn't yet hardened. Even lightly running water can trigger a dangerous process of erosion. In fact, the way that it probably developed is that the creation of this underground sewage infrastructure, already in a less than ideal location, was accelerated by the arrival of volcanic ash from nearby eruptions. If that was able to get into the sewage system, that could have made sinkhole prone ruptures far more probable. This giant sinkhole is a big indicator that we need to keep an eye out on what's going on underneath our cities. Great Blue Hole the Great Blue Hole, located in Belize, is one of the most magnificent sinkholes in the entire world. It is an underwater sinkhole in Lighthouse Reef and seems almost perfectly circular. Its dimensions are also impressive. It has a diameter of nearly 1,000 feet and it goes about 410 feet down into the ocean. In terms of underwater sinkholes, it's the largest of its kind, but it is well known around the world for its distinctive appearance. 
No one is quite sure about when the Great Blue Hole formed, but scientists have some clues. In particular, they analyzed the hole's giant interior stalactites and stalagmites. Through this, they've estimated that the hole started to form somewhere around 153,000 years ago. When sea levels were really low during the Ice Age, this hole was above ground, enabling the formation of the stalactites and stalagmites. Then the ocean water rose once more, filling it in. The water at the Great Blue Hole is very clear and free from human intervention. When explorers recently returned to map the hole, they found only two pieces of plastic trash. Because of this, it's a popular spot for scuba divers who can get really good views of the local flora and fauna. So you can go see this wonder of the world for yourself. Have you ever had the chance to scuba dive in the Great Blue Hole? Let me know in the comments. Katara Depression Located next to the border between Egypt and Libya, the Katara Depression is the largest sinkhole on Earth. We've discussed some crazy big sinkholes on this list, but how about one that's nearly as big as a tiny country? We can only look to that Katara Depression for that distinction. It's humongous. It's approximately 80 kilometers long and 120 kilometers wide, covering over 7,000 square miles of land. At its deepest, it can reach about 480 feet into the ground. This sinkhole didn't form all at once, but rather over the course of thousands of years. Salts caused the ground rock there to erode, and then the desert winds blew these sands away. In time, this took away a great chunk of bedrock and left the groundwater to seep through, giving the area a quicksand-like quality. Because of this, a great deal of it is treacherous to travel through. Wouldn't want to get stuck in a sludge pile. However, there is a possibility that the Katara Depression is so deep that it could be used as a power source for Egypt. Engineers have designed plans to place a big tunnel into the sinkhole and fill it with water, which would then evaporate and refill as time passed, generating a ton of hydroelectric energy. It would definitely be an inventive way to power the country, so hopefully this development continues to receive support as the years go by. Alien Statue here is something you don't want to run into while diving in the ocean. Imagine yourself floating gently through the murky depths on your first diving mission and coming across an alien stuck at the bottom of the water like some kind of horrifying fossil. Well, off the coast of Russia, there is a steampunk xenomorph statue and nobody quite knows where it came from. No artist ever came forward to claim it, and to this day, it is a complete mystery. The alien, or xenomorph as they are known as in the popular franchise, is built in the steampunk fashion with gears and bolts and other metal objects, all of which have taken on a particularly nasty rust from being underwater for so long. Of course, this is not the only steampunk memorabilia around, as there is everything from the infamous Predator made from nuts and bolts to massive Godzillas made from the same. The only difference here is somebody decided to dump their creation into the ocean for unsuspecting divers to stumble upon in dismay. But you know what they say, in the ocean, no one can hear you scream. Human Hand Here is a freaky one for you. This was not something found in the ocean exactly, but more of something found inside of a shark's belly. And obviously sharks live in the ocean. The terrifying object found inside of a shark in 2019 was a severed human hand, complete with a wedding ring. The shark had been killed because it had already been deemed a threat. In the autopsy, they found that inside of the massive 10-foot, 3-meter tiger shark was a man's hand. This immediately raised an alarm, because in the same area of Saint-Gilles, a 44-year-old Scottish tourist had been reported missing after going for a swim by himself. According to Metro News, the unnamed man and his wife had been spending a week on vacation on the island of Reunion, and after the man failed to return from his swim, his wife had sent for help. However, even after divers searched the sea, there was absolutely no sign of the man, other than the hand pulled from the shark. Definitely, it was a shocking autopsy. The last thing I would want on a nice relaxing vacation is to have an unpleasant encounter with a tiger shark. And now for number eight, but first, what is the thing that scares you the most about the sea? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to subscribe if you are new here. Anaconda This one did not happen in the sea, but it did happen in the Formosa River in Brazil, which is basically the Amazonian Sea. In any case, when Bartolomeu Bove and his diving partner strapped on their gear and went for a dive in the river with their equipment, Bartolomeo was quick to run into a giant green anaconda, 23 feet, 7 meters in length, and weighing almost 200 pounds, which is 91 kilograms, simply lounging in the water like you or I would lounge in the tub. Rather than run away screaming like I definitely would have, Bartolomeo decided to shove his underwater camera in the giant snake's face. This kind of discovery would have terrified anyone, but it did not phase the diver at all. 
and it didn't seem to phase the anaconda either, who slithered off through the water like a massive eel completely at ease. The snake gave the camera a quick lick, apparently a little curious, and then went about its business, which shows that these animals are not the aggressive and dangerous things everyone has believed them to be. I don't know how the cameraman could have stayed so calm, because I am terrified right now just thinking about being underwater with a giant snake. Have you ever found a scary animal while you were swimming? Blackbeard's Vessel Blackbeard was arguably the most infamous pirate in the history of pirates, and for a long time, Blackbeard's famous ship, the Queen Anne's Revenge, was lost beneath the waves, but it was found in 1996. I can't imagine a more terrifying shipwreck to discover on the bottom of the ocean. The Queen Anne's Revenge began her life as a slaving vessel for the French, before Blackbeard got a hold of it and terrorized the Caribbean. The ship was equipped with up to 40 guns, a whole team of bloodthirsty pirates, and a multitude of other weapons. This boat will continue to be the most fear-inspiring vessel for the rest of history. The wreck was found in 1996 in Palm Bay, Florida. And in 1998, the state made an agreement that gave Intersal Inc. rights to make copyrighted photos and videos of it. Florida and North Carolina began excavating the wreck and in 2011, North Carolina state authorities confirmed that the shipwreck was undoubtedly the Queen Anne's Revenge. In the wreck, they found apothecary weights stamped with little fleur de lis royal French symbols, a small amount of gold, many weapons, and a bell engraved with the date 1705. What a great treasure. In 2015, the state of North Carolina passed a law where all images related to the Queen Anne's Revenge excavation were instantly property of the state and public records without copyright protection. Interestingly enough, Blackbeard died on a different ship on November 22nd, 1718, and was killed in action. Blackbeard's reign of terror was finally over as he was filled with five gunshots and impaled at least 20 times by both swords and knives. What a miserable end to a miserable person, and an interesting legacy left at the bottom of the ocean for hundreds of years. World War II Remains This is a truly grisly sight to behold. After the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor during World War II, America targeted a Japanese military base at Chuk Lagoon in Micronesia. The attack was carried out by 500 aircrafts and additional submarines, and even though the Japanese took most of their larger ships from the area beforehand, the USA managed to sink 47 boats, 270 aircraft, and 1,700 Japanese servicemen. Today, the terrifying remnants of that battle can be found rotting away at the bottom of the lagoon. In fact, this is the world's largest ship graveyard. Boats can be seen riddled with torpedo holes while other paraphernalia is scattered across the lagoon's floor. A dive below the surface of the water will yield terrifying images of gas masks, unopened beer bottles, and even rotting shoes. This horrible underwater museum is a brutal reminder of our not-so-distant past. The only good thing about all of this twisted metal at the bottom of the sea is that it has attracted lots of great marine life. There are now turtles, sharks, and manta rays that continuously visit the rusted and deteriorated ships. However, three of the sunken tankers are estimated to contain about 32,000 tons of oil. It is only a matter of time until all of that oil spills out and causes even more damage. Neptune Memorial Reef I have mixed feelings about Neptune Memorial Reef. Just 3 miles, 5 kilometers, off the coast of Miami Beach and roughly 40 feet, 12 meters, beneath the waves, Neptune Memorial Reef is both terrifying and shockingly beautiful. This is a graveyard. That's right, a literal underwater graveyard. The entire memorial was inspired by the lost city of Atlantis. It has sunken columns, lion statues, roadways, and it looks very much like a lost city. This is a place full of marine life, interesting imagery, and the graves of the deceased. If you want to visit it, you have to go to the authorized shops in Miami and ask for a tour. They are going to accept divers and snorkelers that want to visit this place. Even if you are a novice, a professional diver, or if you are looking to get certified, they can bring you all the information about the plans they have. While Neptune Memorial Reef can certainly appear terrifying, it is still a very popular scuba site and snorkeling site. It is also home to many graves. You are able to purchase a special headstone which incorporates a person's ashes into a cement mold of something marine themed. And so, if you were diving and came upon this underwater graveyard, I bet you would think it was terrifying with all the headstones and themed graves. The first thing that comes to mind are underwater zombies, even if there are no actual bodies. Say what you will, but it is a ghoulish thing to see a sunken graveyard. Serene, beautiful, 
and oddly unnerving. Christ of the Abyss Off the coast of Italy is arguably the most religious underwater monument ever placed into the ocean. It is also a terrible thing to find when diving in that area, as it looks more like a menacing ocean god beckoning you to Davy Jones' locker than the King of Heaven. This bronze statue was made by Guido Galletti. In August 1954, it was placed upon the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea as an honor to Dario Gonzati, the first Italian to use scuba diving gear. Placed 56 feet 17 meters under the waves, where it stays to this day. This divine statue may have begun life looking majestic and powerful, but years of sitting at the bottom of the sea has turned it into a terrifying piece that looks nothing like Jesus Christ anymore. It looks like a bronze Poseidon welcoming you to a watery grave. The statue is burdened by some kind of marine growth that has made the face of Jesus appear mutated and covered in some kind of biological slime. Basking Shark Definitely one of the most terrifying things found in the sea is Basking Shark. But not just the Basking Shark, I'm talking about the Basking Shark with its mouth wide open. This is the second largest fish in the world, and it is a filter feeder. When the basking shark decides to eat, it opens its massive mouth and basically inhales whatever tiny little morsels of plankton gets in the way. But its open mouth looks more like a cave than anything else. Staring into the basking shark's gaping jaw is like staring into the gates of hell. Basking sharks reach lengths of 6 feet 2 meters when babies, and commonly up to 40 feet 12 meters at adulthood. They usually live in the equatorial zone, being commonly solitary creatures, but sometimes can form large groups of more than 100 individuals. These creatures live for about 50 years, and the females have a gestation period of at least 3 years. The basking shark is much more terrifying than a great white, an octopus, or a squid. But what makes it even more terrifying is that the basking shark spends most of its time very close to the surface of the water, swimming with its ridiculously large mouth completely open so that it can suck in food. This is undoubtedly one of the most terrifying things you could happen upon while swimming in the ocean. Have you ever swam with sharks? How was that experience? Let me know in the comments below. Sunken Crosses of Mouth Peak here is something you don't see every day, an underwater graveyard commemorating a group of martyred missionaries from the 16th century. Yes, this is the second graveyard on the list, but honestly, is anything more terrifying to discover under the sea, other than perhaps a 40-foot shark or a real-life kraken, than weathered crosses scattered over the seabed? The location is in La Palma, Spain. The exact distance is 65 feet 20 meters underneath the ocean. The story is more than 400 years old, from 1570 to be precise. At that time, the Canary Islands had been under the control of the Spanish. The islands were also extremely vulnerable to pirates, and so when a Portuguese missionary by the name of Inácio de Acevedo and his group of 39 Jesuit companions were in the area, their vessel was bombarded by French pirates, led by Jacques de Soros, who wanted the ship and all the cargo. Of course, he didn't want the 40 men aboard the ship, so he decided to torture them and threw them into the sea, while watching how they slowly drowned and sunk to the bottom of the sea. Then, hundreds of years later in 1742, the men were declared martyrs. Still, it was not until the year 2000 that 40 crosses were dropped into the sea at the location as a memorial to the murdered missionaries. This is such a compelling story that it continues through the ages. In 2014, a big stone cross was erected at a nearby lighthouse with all of their names inscribed onto it. And while the crosses are in no way malicious, it is still a terrifying thing to stumble upon at the bottom of the sea. Man in a Boat this has got to be one of the most terrifying discoveries in recent years. It all started in 2013 when a tugboat was toppled by a swell off the coast of Nigeria and sunk. While 11 people died on that tugboat, one man named Okin managed to survive inside of a small 4 foot 1.2 meter pocket of air. He survived there for 3 full days by drinking small sips of Coca Cola. In a report from USA Today, it is detailed that a team of South African divers on their way to investigate the capsized tugboat were absolutely shocked to find the man sitting nonchalantly in an air bubble 30 meters beneath the surface of the Atlantic Ocean. This is an incredible and terrifying story. The divers were able to rescue Okian by putting him in a harness, giving him an oxygen mask, and then swiftly taking him into a decompression chamber. The man was then held inside of the decompression chamber for 60 hours so that his body pressure was able to return to normal. At the end of the day, the man was saved. This incredible event will undoubtedly be with him forever. Part of the food chain Think of the great white sharks as not only a top predator in the sea, but also an important part of the food chain. 
Great Whites have been around for more than 450 million years, 200 million years before dinosaurs, making them a key part in keeping the ocean system healthy. They need to eat a lot. Sure, sharks dine on animals smaller than them, but it is an important part of the food chain. With their ability to balance the ocean's ecosystem by maintaining the species below them, they play a vital role in keeping the ocean healthy. By removing the weak or sick species, they also keep balance with competitors, helping to ensure diversity. If they were to be removed from the ocean altogether, it would alter the feeding habits and diets of other species. Underwater plants such as seagrass and coral reefs would also be affected, with both declining, throwing the ecosystem into chaos. Removing sharks from the coral reef ecosystem would mean larger predatory fish would increase and feed on the herbivores, increasing algae, further polluting the oceans, and directly affecting the coral reef systems which are already suffering from climate change. So although they may get a bad rap, the Great White is a vital piece of the ecological puzzle. Too smart to be caged. Although TV shows and movies make out sharks to be big scary predators, they are in fact quite misunderstood. With more than 400 shark species in the world, Great Whites are one of the most recognizable. But they are not just mindless drones, and instead are known to create mental maps that allow them to sense not only magnetic fields, but to read the signals from ocean currents, determine water temperature, and even smell other creatures. A self-sufficient species, these animals have also been known to learn how to recognize shapes and optical illusions that they can remember for at least a year. All of this swimming and global mapping means that putting them in an aquarium is not going to be enough for them. A study done on juvenile sharks showed that they were able to recognize and remember shapes after being kept in a special holding tank into which images were projected onto the walls. Four sharks were taught to choose a triangle, and when they did so, they received a small piece of food for pressing their nose on the triangle-shaped button. The study done by a university in Germany showed that recognition, visual cues, and translating them into earning a reward was an experiment that provided surprising results. However, like orcas, in captivity they don't do very well. Their size Ranging from 47 meters in length and weighing up to 400 kilograms, sharks are one of the largest predators of the ocean. Although their narrow pointed snout, pectoral fins, and dorsal fin are distinct properties characteristics of the shark, it is their size that proves to be a downfall to keeping them in captivity. Because these aquatic animals have to constantly swim forward to allow water to pass over their gills to provide them oxygen, any aquarium would need to have a massive tank to keep the shark not only happy, but healthy. Sharks also travel over huge distances in the wild, with one female shark once documented to have traveled from Africa to Australia and back again, taking just 9 months to travel to 12,400 miles. In 2004, the Monterey Bay Aquarium kept a great white shark alive for 198 days. Holding 1 million gallons of water and reaching a depth of 35 feet, the tank was specially designed for open ocean animals. With the shark only measuring 4 feet long, it was much smaller than the average adult great white, which measures around 15 feet. Because it was much smaller, the shark mostly consumed fish instead of the usual diets of seals, sea turtles, and small whales that more mature great whites eat. Although this allowed for an easier time feeding the animal, the tight dietary needs of the great white were not the only problem. The staff at the Monterey Bay Aquarium later moved the shark into a 4 million gallon pen that allowed them to monitor it before they transported it from Southern California to the Monterey Bay campus. But within six months of capture and display, the aquarium decided to release the shark into the wild after it attacked two other sharks in captivity. Over the years, the aquarium continued to display other infant great whites, but none of them lasted the same amount of time as the original great white did. Feeding Rituals Sharks need live prey to stay alive, so having to continually keep them in seals, sea lions, dolphins, and whale corpses, their favorite foods, is not only difficult, but might turn away aquarium guests who might not want to watch the particularly gruesome spectacle of shark feedings. A carnivorous creature, sharks feed on smaller animals including squids, rays, and other fish. They are also known to catch turtles and seabirds, preferring a fat-rich prey. This means that aquarium staff would need to procure a variety of food for any sharks they keep in captivity. Beyond that, a shark has particular feeding habits, using their electroreceptors to locate food. 
because they tend to stalk their prey and then inflict a deadly bite and wait for the animal to bleed out before eating it, it would make for a particularly gruesome display for the general public coming to visit these predators. Even though most people have a picture of a malevolent feeding machine, great whites are actually finicky eaters. Scientists found that some great whites even engage in ritualized competition over kills with the two slapping their tails on the sea surface to determine who is the winner. Some researchers even found that when the sharks are unable to capture food, they get visibly frustrated and agitated, and can even become sad and dejected. It makes sense that without the ability to hunt in the open ocean, sharks in captivity would lose their sense of hunting and normal behavior and stop eating altogether. Affecting the Economy Although the environmental and ecological effects are more important than money, it's hard to disregard how removing sharks from the oceans would indirectly affect the economy. A study done in North Carolina showed that by losing great white sharks in their waters, stingray populations were increased, resulting in more bay scallops being eaten by predators and fisheries having to be closed. Without scallops to eat, the rays moved on to other bivalves, including clams that were used in many restaurants. Food aside, sharks are a large draw for ecotourists. In the Bahamas, dive tourism can make up to $250,000 by having a single live reef shark in the ocean for tourists to visit. But when caught by fishermen, sharks are only worth $50 to the fishermen who caught it. Similarly, a whale shark in Belize has been known to bring in $200 million over its lifetime to tourists who want to swim with and see the sharks in their natural habitat. Although the health and safety of these animals are most important, there is a definite connection between sharks and the economy. A Protected Species One of the most dangerous predators in the ocean, sharks are not only feared but protected. They are mostly illegally hunted with the capture and killing of great whites against the law. Protected in California waters since 1994 and in the American Atlantic waters since 1997, the great white is one of 10 other shark species that are protected from fishing in American waters. But why is such a fearsome predator so protected? Dating back more than 400 million years, sharks are much older than dinosaurs. Their unique senses of smell, hearing, touch, taste, sight, and even electromagnetism make it one of the top predators in the ocean. Even though the image of a shark in the water strikes fear in the heart of many people, the only real threat to their survival are humans. Often killed by getting caught in long lines and trawlers, they are also sometimes victims of illegal poaching for those who want to sell their fins for soup. Sport fishermen also sometimes target sharks to obtain their jaws as trophies. With an estimated 100 million sharks killed every year by fisheries, it would be a shame to see these ancient predators become extinct in our lifetime. Tank Confusion Many fish, including sharks, have evolved to travel fast and for great distances in the open ocean. Glass enclosures such as tanks and aquariums prove to be not only dangerous but fatal to those sharks brought into places like SeaWorld and San Francisco's Steinhardt Aquarium in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. When sharks were kept in glass enclosures, they tended to ram into walls and injure themselves. It is believed that being surrounded by glass could confuse or overload the shark's electroreception system that helps them to sense electrical signals given off by fish in the open ocean. Although the Monterey Bay Aquarium once housed a great white shark in 2004, the large tank and intensive support wasn't enough to keep the shark safe. Even though they used a smaller baby shark, it didn't stop it from having health issues, and after 190 days, they released the shark and stopped hosting them in 2011. A glass tank inside a building just seems like an unnatural place for a shark, so although it might be nice to see one up close, knowing how they can suffer makes keeping them in the wild seem that much more important. Active Behavior The fact the great whites are not only solitary fish but are active both day and night would make it a strenuous task to keep them happy if they were to be in captivity. The fact that they also sometimes jump out of the water to look around for prey would also make it difficult to keep them contained in a small tank. A powerful and aggressive predator, great whites are a dominant species, so it would make it difficult for them to be placed in the vicinity of any other marine animals. A predator at the top of the food chain, any worries about sharks attacking people don't seem to be a reason not to add them to the roster at a local museum. But these large fish are simply ones that should not be tamed. Their gills aren't only to help them breathe, their gills are also used to remove carbon dioxide waste from the shark's body. Because other shark species have different methods of breathing, it is safe for them to be kept in aquariums. Both nurse and bullhead sharks use their mouth muscles to draw water into their mouths and over their gills, which allows them to breathe while still. Others use a method called ram ventilation, where they swim with their mouths open, pushing water through their gills. 
great whites, as well as makos and whale sharks use this method to breathe, which is why if they stop swimming, they can die. Keeping them comfortable. Found in both tropical coastal waters and even cold water, great whites thrive everywhere from the coast of North America, from Newfoundland to southern Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean, and from Alaska to southern Mexico and the Pacific. They also dwell in waters of South Africa, the Mediterranean, Japan, and Oceania. With such a varied locale, it would take a lot of work to adapt an indoor habitat for great whites. In the open ocean, they tend to inhabit water up to 1,200 meters deep, even going so far as to swim up to 1,875 meters deep. Needing such a varied habitat, it seems like it would take a lot of trial and error to get the climate right. A study done in 2014 estimated that the region between 660 and 3300 feet below the ocean surface had 10 times more fish than originally believed. With colder water at deeper distances, sharks do this to take advantage of abundant prey in the ocean's depths. A hostile community Even though sharks are at the top of the food chain, that doesn't mean that other fish can't be a threat to them. Triggerfish, angelfish, and puffers can all injure smaller sharks. Figuring all this out in an aquarium doesn't seem like an easy feat. If the shark is big, it will eat everything, and if it's small enough to fit in an aquarium, there are many things that can be harmful to it. It might seem strange to think that a smaller fish could injure a shark, but if one were to accidentally put a porcupine fish in the same tank as a shark, it could prove deadly for the predator. Photos of a hungry shark who tried to swallow a spiny porcupine fish are evidence enough that the pair can be dangerous together. After the shark suffocated on its supper, the porcupine fish became stuck halfway in the shark's mouth and blocked the predator's gills. Just because the great white is one of the most feared fish in the ocean, that doesn't mean there aren't things that make them vulnerable. Maybe knowing that will make you a little less leery the next time you go for a swim and see a shadow dart below the surface. Or not. Thanks for watching. What do you think about great whites? Do you like aquariums? Let us all know what you think in the comments below. And be sure to subscribe to Taltanic for some more awesome videos.